Hello, Cyril. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm really um, looking forward to our conversation. It's lovely to join you today. And I know that we both have so much in common with how we work. You as a family lawyer for Foot and Stee, where you work with divorce and family law, and myself as a transformational coach, where I help people to change their lives for the better. And we both want the same outcome using empathy, compassion, and working with the best outcome for our clients. So is there such a thing as a good divorce? Well, I've been doing, um, I've been helping divorcing couples for many years now, and I have seen, um, you know, very many different situations. And from my experience, you can see from the most acrimonious uh, couples to couples who are perhaps better better have been better friends and are trying to divorce more amicably but I think emotion always comes into it and unfortunately that does create tensions and upsets and actually I don't perhaps think there's not such a thing as a good divorce but um, some experiences are better than others and that's my role really to try and help help um, not just legally get everybody um, out of the situations as, as best we can but also help um, the, from a human aspect, help, help the couples and particularly obviously my client get through their divorce um, reasonably emotionally intact. So what is a good divorce? That's an interesting question. Um, I've been divorcing couples for many years and I have seen the wide range of experiences that couples go through and uh, from the very acrimonious to the reasonably amicable. Um, and I'm not sure there is something as a, a good divorce but I think people can make it as as good as it can be and that involves the parties trying to work together and um, also the legal advisors trying to work together as well and um, making sure that not just the legal side of things uh, run as smoothly as possible but also ensuring that each of our clients are um, emotionally supported as well. For me a good divorce is when all the parties can remain on speaking terms and especially for the sake of the children. So what are the main reasons that most people get divorced? There's quite a few reasons, and I think probably the main reasons are people fall out of love, um, they've been married a long time, um, non-compatibility from the start, that quite often happens. Um, somebody's had an affair, sadly, or there has been some serious emotional abuse, sometimes physical abuse as well, so quite a few reasons. So what are the biggest sticking points or contentious elements during a divorce? Well, I think probably, sadly, it's money. Finances, trying to resolve the finances can bring out huge emotions, um, panic amongst couples trying to work out whether they can um, move forward. Uh, and I think that then has a knock-on effect on perhaps some children issues because um, the more acrimonious it, it gets, sadly, I think the children do suffer because couples can tend to lose sight of of what their priority is, and that really is trying to keep the family, okay, it could be a separated family, but keeping it as intact as possible for the sake of the children. It's still as a it's unit. Still in as some, way. some sort of a unit, exactly. So I think that's probably um, the hardest part of divorce, yes. So, how can the negative impact on children be reduced? This really does require work from both parents, and they have to see that actually speaking about each other in a negative light is really not um, not good for the children trying to put their own personal views about each other aside and promote each of them as a parent um, in their own right and encourage the children to go and see each parent um, if that's you know unless there's something serious that, that they can't go and see that parent but um, and um, just ensuring that their their children are listened to and cared for throughout the process, and that they that they are not sort of lost in the whole in the whole what is sometimes acrimonious situation. So, um, in my view, it's very much the same as yours to support the family and the children emotionally, because children, in the end, as they grow up, will form their own opinions on either parent whether one was guilty or not, or whatever the reasons. And I often will encourage the partner who is not in the full-time care of the children to keep as much contact as possible. That's very interesting, actually, because those are the actual challenges that we as lawyers face, is trying to get the parties to see that um, they should be encouraging that, that contact with the 
the, the, the non-resident parent. Um, and that's a very hard, that's not a sort of legal, <laughs> a legal application that you can really make somebody to, somebody to encourage to see the child. Um, so that's where your role sounds extremely interesting. So what is the makeup of the clients who come to you? So I deal with um, a huge variety of clients, both men and women, uh, same-sex couples separating, same-sex couples getting married, because obviously I do prenuptial pre agreements and postnuptial agreements. Um, people of varying ages, uh, I tend to see, I probably at the moment I'm seeing a lot of couples in their 30s to 50s divorcing, um, and I do have older couples who are they termed as silver and grey divorces. Um, so it really is a wide range of, of clients that I see. Do you find there's a difference of how they approach you in the different age groups? I do. I think um, some of the older generation, they tend to be a little bit more reserved and um, also I think they need a little bit more guidance, particularly some of the couples who haven't worked. They, um, I think the, the, the younger the younger divorcing couples, most are in employment, so they have um, a good understanding of finances and how they perhaps will survive after divorce on their own. Um, so there is, there are differences. I can imagine that quite often with the older age couples, there's, or the much older generation, where the wife has been the supporting system. Very often the wife has no clue of what was actually happening on the financial side or anything like that. I think you're absolutely right, and I think as we see the generations change, I think that's mo we're moving away from that. But the, certainly the older, perhaps as you say, females um, haven't had um, that experience with running the family finances, and they tend to be quite um, alarmed by divorce and a bit worried about what's going to happen after and how they're going to manage their finances and also how they're going to generally and emotionally um, be strong once they are out of that relationship, which I think is perhaps where you quite often step in. So what is the shortest time a divorce has ever lasted? Um, I think probably the shortest I've ever done, and this is before the new um, no fault divorce came in where you have to wait six months to actually get divorced, um, probably within, I should say about five or six months. That's impressive. Yes. And the longest? Oh, the longest, sadly, and this is all sorts of reasons for it, court, court waiting times, acrimonious clients, lots of court applications, I should say about four years. Is it possible to stay friends after a divorce? I am still friends with my ex-husband and I was married for 25 years and we've been friends for the following 15, including his subsequent marriage. <laughs> so it is possible. Um, however, I believe I'm a rarity. So, what's your take? I think you're absolutely right. I think you are a rarity. Um, I think it's absolutely all credits to you and your ex-husband um, to have maintained that. From what I have seen, I think it's, it is quite difficult to remain friends. Um, most couples at the end of the process are not really, um, not really friends in that sense. I think they can, a lot of them can continue to co-parent if their children are involved. Um, but generally I think that's a very hard thing to do with all the emotions that come in and certainly if we've been through court proceedings that can be quite bruising as much as we try and make it as le less stress, you know, stress free as possible it is going to be quite a bruising experience so I think with court proceedings involved it's quite difficult to remain um, friends which is why we try and not launch straight into the court process and try and find a way of res resolving matters as amicably as we can. Do you use a mediator with your divorce clients ever? Can that help the situation? It can. So we've got mediation on different levels. You've got the financial mediation and that we quite often refer clients who can sit in the same room together um, to start the, the financial process with a mediator. That's more cost effective and um, sort of takes the intensity of lawyers out of the situation. Um, other than that, we sometimes when you can see that a third party might be helpful, whether that's a family member or a neutral, a mutual friend, um, that sometimes does help, but I certainly do believe that having a mediator there does help the process if there is one and if it is possible, if the, if the situation isn't too acrimonious. Does it help your role as well? It does, absolutely, it does. It gives us um, trying to sort of balance uh, supporting the clients emotionally uh, with doing the legal um, aspect.
aspect of the work, so yes it does.